The time is coming fast and I think this day is near When he's shown in traitor he will run before us And if there'll be a need, well our kids will say Godspeed With a verse of two of singing this fine chorus left Ireland during the Depression, took the ferry from Belfast to England. This is actually the ferry ship that he would have taken across the Irish Sea. He soon found himself in London, where he set about to find work, even though England was still in the throes of the Great Depression. But he did find work working in early television and radar for the development of this exciting new technology. He worked for Sobel Radio and Television before the war, servicing televisions that were manufactured by that company. He did actually meet John Logie Baird, inventor of television at that time. Things were looking up.
Britain was at war. This is an actual recording of the air raid siren sounding. First the alarm, and then the all clear. A sound that the survivors will never forget. London was in flames. And Joe joined the RAF. Where he was assigned as a service technician on radar and radio in the airfields in Britain. Churchill says the results they have obtained give us just confidence in the approaching struggle. These are some of the pilots, Canadians, who are daily hurling Spitfire, Hurricane or Defiant into the masses of not continue to be sent against us. Come on, Come on. Hitler hopes to gain the mastery of the air, but so long as the British Empire breeds men like these, it is Britain who will gain and hold the mastery. The fighter command has already performed wonders and at every alarm it gains fresh glory. Hurricanes come home. Our fighters land after a brisk but successful encounter with hit and run raiders. Here's a typical scene at one of our fighter bases between battles. These are some of the boys who've already blunted Hitler's air offensive. In due course, they'll stop it altogether. They take it easy between raids, and there's always plenty of sport to be had when there's no serious work to be done in the sky. When the alarm does come, not a second is lost. Blue section out there. While the public takes shelter, our fighter pilots take off to destroy the enemy. bitter struggle of the Second World War, one weapon was paramount to the final outcome of victory. A weapon that was so secret, it was almost never spoken of. On land, air and sea, it was a weapon that spanned the globe. It brought together the world's top scientific and military minds. With it, women for the first time worked the front lines of battle, and it helped deliver the most destructive force of World War II. Yet this weapon was invisible to the enemy. It was called radar. Every single battle that was fought by Americans, by British troops, radar became a key component. We saw it grow up and it became our tool to help defeat the enemy. Thank God for radar, the United States Navy. Since the early 1930s, scientists in several countries had been experimenting with radio beams. It was known that when these beams hit certain objects, they were deflected. Yet, could this knowledge be put to a different use? Well, of all these places in the world that invented radar, Britain was the one that had the most pressing need to, to fast forward its development as a, as a defensive weapon. The Air Ministry offered a prize of 1,000 pounds to anyone who could build a death ray that could kill a sheep at 100 yards. Although this appeared to be in the realm of science fiction, the British government was worried that the Germans were working on such devices. Soon, 350-foot-high radar towers began to sprout up around the coastline of Britain. This was the beginning of a construction program that would enable the RAF to search the skies for any threatening sign. The towers, however, were not always greeted with enthusiasm. Local landowners were worried that they might interfere with their hunting. By late 1938, Britain had constructed a series of these towers all along its coast, from Portsmouth in the south to Scotland in the north. Each tower's transmission range extended to over 100 miles. Together, they formed an invisible shield that no aircraft could penetrate undetected. This entire web of surveillance became known as the chain home system. 
For the confused Germans, their equipment told them that the British had no operational radar. They thought the towers might have been some forms of civilian aircraft landing system. Hitler and Goering were delighted. They now felt that when the war came, the Battle of Britain was as good as won. Goering was entirely dismissive of what he called these radio installations. You don't fight a war with radio installations, you fight them with bombers. Joe was eventually assigned to a radar base in Scotland where he worked as a technician.
It was here that he met the love of his life. Kiss by kiss, you're leading me on in this bliss.